People often think about uh, Silaria as, as drooling in Parkinson's disease as just being something that happens and is not a big deal. And it's often minimized, not only uh, by clinicians, but also by our patients. Not always by their caregivers, who are often maybe more concerned about it. Um, and we know about the physical problems that can occur in the skin and the risk of posterior and aspiration and, and those risks, the social withdrawal and embarrassment and patients stop going to dinners and lunches. And we know how it influences caregivers and how frustrated they can be of why, why patients just can't stop drooling. What are you, why are you doing this? And it can disrupt sleep overnight and patients have to get up and change their bedclothes or, or the pillowcase. But I think there's also more to it. And, and I think some of our patients have described it in ways that I never thought about. I had a patient whose wife uh, comes and, and says, well, it's not just the drooling that, that I see that's embarrassing, but it goes on the floor. I think he's going to slip on the tile. I never thought you'd have so much drooling that it would actually go, but where else is it going to go? If it doesn't drip onto the shirt, it's going to drip onto the floor. So that made me think differently. Um, you've I've had, had patients where, well, obviously it does drip on the shirt. I have patients who have to wear a bib uh, uh, or they have to change their clothing four times a day or their clothing is stained uh, because, of, because of the drooling. Uh, the other thing we didn't mention is the gurgling speech. It's hard to speak when you have too much saliva in your mouth and so interferes with communication. Speaking, speaking on the phone is very hard if, if you had excessive saliva. And it's often worse at meals. So imagine going to dinner with friends and they may not have it the rest of the day, but they serve the steak and the faucets come on and it's very embarrassing uh, and impedes their social life. So it's a, it's a significant problem in terms of not just the physical problems that you mentioned, the excoriation, the, the aspiration, but, but the social isolation. Yeah. Uh, you have grandkids and your granddaughter wants to give you a kiss and you're drooling. It, it's horrible uh, in terms of the interaction. And so it interferes with their interpersonal relationships. It's, it's, so I think it, it's a much bigger impact on a patient's quality of life that we're always trying to improve. But I think we tend to minimize some of these things that we can treat that impact quality of life. And we focus so much on motor symptoms and motor fluctuations and off periods and off time and, and even dyskinesia, when really there's non-motor symptoms that often are much bigger drivers for impaired quality of life than these motor symptoms. Sure. Uh, everyone seems to focus on tremor, you know, or, uh, or the on-offs, which are significant and can be a problem but the non-motor are better predictors of disability. And I think the one thing about treating silaria with botulinum toxins is that the, the improvement is so predictable and often reliable to begin within a week and see the full effect in, in, in so, so quickly. And, and it lasts often three months. Sometimes it wears off sooner, but sometimes it lasts even longer than three months. So I think patients begin to rely. I think one uh, way we, we sort of think about it at times is if the patient's being treated for silaria, uh, would say myoblock, they're coming every three months. They're not missing their appointments. These are not the patients that no-show. They're coming in and trying to come in earlier to make sure that they can get the, the injection again. So I think it really is a testament to the demonstrated efficacy and safety and tolerability that we saw in the clinical trials. But I think we've seen for a long time, even before these uh, uh, recent approvals for indications, uh, with these two botulinum toxins, uh, Zeom and Myoblock, we've been using these toxins for years to, to treat silaria. My experience has been the same. There, I can think of many patients who were reluctant to have that first injection. They didn't want to have it. They agreed to have it, and then they're not missing appointments after that. Once they see the benefit, um, then uh, they're pretty religious about keeping those follow-up injection appointments. Now, sometimes patients do tend to minimize the symptom, whether it's out of embarrassment or they just don't want another medication or they want to talk about something else that day. Um, but what do you do when, when a patient seems that they would want to have the toxin, but they're maybe a little fearful or a little reluctant and, and not really um, feeling that it's safe? How, how do you talk to your patients? What, what do you say to them to to reassure them that this is something that we've used for a long time and in trials was found to be safe and effective. I do tell them that I've been using it for about 12 years and that I found it to be 
very safe, very effective, that have not seen systemic adverse effects. The effects that may occur are local. It's going to reduce the production of saliva. And I'm going to start with very low doses. I start with only the parotid mm -hmm. at a very low dose, usually about 1,500 to 2,000, which I understand for most people is going to be too little. And I say, I'll oh, probably going to underdose you as long as you don't have side effects, we can go up on that. And we'll go up slowly so that you don't get too much and that would minimize. And I very rarely, with this approach, have people complain of dry mouth. Uh, and so side effects are pretty rare and far between. Uh, benefit is pretty much the rule. Uh, so I tell them they'll probably do very well. Yeah. I often like to, to go over to them and show them it's just going to be a hypodermic needle here and here and here and here, and in fact, that's about how long it will take. Right. And then within a week or two, you're not gonna have this drooling here and on your shirt and, and elsewhere. So you don't have to have this anymore. And I think trying to just be proactive and let patients know that there's a effective treatment for this um, that we found to be safe. And the dry mouth that occurs is often along with the tempo of the improvement and peaks and, and falls off as well. So it's, it's often not a problem that prevents patients from being re-injected. You use a 30 gauge needle as well, the half inch. Yes. And a lot of patients, uh, I'll do the procedure and they'll ask me when I'm gonna start and I'll yes. say, we're done. We're done. Uh, it, it really is very quick and for most people fairly painless. So I think when we put together this under recognition, it probably reflected not having effective treatment options. But now that we have treatment options, we're beginning to recognize in our patients how much it's impaired uh, some of their daily, how much it's impacted some of their daily activities and impair their quality of life. And I think the more we talk about it, the greater awareness we have to our patients, their families and caregivers, to our peers and other clinicians who treat patients with Parkinson's. I think recognizing its impact on daily activities and, and quality of life will drive more people to want to inject to try to help their patients.